Okay, good, uh, good afternoon everybody again. Uh, thank you all for coming to our opening session of the conference Effective Transformations, Politics, Algorithms, Media. When we wrote the outline of this conference a few months back, we deliberately pointed out that the effective turn, which was proclaimed exactly a decade ago by Patricia Clough's book, recently has come under pressure. For some years, it was possible to interpret the re renewed fascination with affects, emotions, feelings, and moods in the humanities, in neuroscience, and also in arts, as a predominantly liberating development. The beginning of the effective turn was dated back to the 1990s, a time when the internet was still very young. Web 2.0 wasn't yet invented, meaning that there were no social media around. It was also a pre-smartphone era. Effect studies emerged in a time before these inventions began to exert their disruptive psychic and social effects. It was also a time before the term algorithm um, acquired such sinister connotations as it is used with, with now. This timing of the effective turn may explain why it promised so much liberation and even the potential of improving political and social life. But uh, 2007 was not only the year the effective turn was proclaimed, that same year the first generation iPhone was released. Now, 10 years later, three new iPhone models are entering the market and it is a striking coincidence that the most advanced one, iPhone X, is set for release within the duration of this conference. I mention this not for advertisement purposes, but because the iPhone X will be the first model to use a facial recognition system. It seems likely that this system will not just be used for face IDing its users and for the so-called animojis that are featured prominently during the Apple keynote this September, and I think marie Luise will talk about it uh, in more in depth, but also for emotion recognition applications in the near future. What would it mean when our digital environment that we use every day became capable of detecting our emotions in real time? Is this just the next logical step in improving user experience, or are we not rather facing a new method of surveillance when effective data is being collected on such a vast scale? And how will the advancement of effective media technologies transform the way we perceive, categorize, and regulate our own effects? Caution may, it well be, uh, may at least be well advised, since during the last years we witnessed how social media enabled a disturbing rise of hate speech, cyber mobbing, public shaming, felt truths, and populism stealing in resentment and outrage. This transformation of the public sphere has ongoing effects on political decisions and thus on humanity's overall capability of dealing with the most menacing problems it has ever faced. Now we could say that media theory from its onset tried to explore and analyze the psychic and social consequences of new technologies, as Marshall McLuhan stated in his book, Understanding Media. Many of the examples that McLuhan gives deal with effective consequences. For example, when he assumes that phonetic culture endows men with the means of repressing their feelings and emotions. Or when he says that the telegraph ushered in the age of anxiety and of pervasive dread. Along the line of his teacher McLuhan, Derek de Kerkhoff thus proposed to redefine media as psychotechnologies. This term conveys the idea that media rearrange and transform the organization of psychic processes, such as attention, memory, and emotions. New technologies like writing, printing, telegraphy, cinema, or television were not designed to transform human affectivity, even though they may have had far-reaching effects on it. With affect technologies, the case is entirely different. The whole design is centered on the capture of affects and the subsequent triggering of effective responses, which are again measured and categorized. The idea is to create an effective feedback loop with the promise to improve the user's well-being, if not happiness. But of course, we do not yet know how the implementation of these technologies will change and transform existing effective cultures. The simultaneous emergence of effective media with the promise of increasing emotional control and of uncontrolled social media affects serves as a starting point for our conference. 
We want to examine this apparent paradox within the next three days. This conference is um, part of the Network Affect and Psychotechnology Studies, which is funded by the German Re Research Foundation, DFG. This network was constituted almost exactly two years ago here at the University of Potsdam, where we held our first workshop. And we are delighted to have the opportunity to conclude this first project phase with a public conference at the very same place. All the active members of the network will be presenting lectures during the conference. We clustered our respective research focuses into four panels that are paired with invited lectures by international scholars from such different research areas as political science, psychology, sociology, philosophy, and of course, media studies. I want to thank you on behalf of the whole network that you accepted our invitation and took the effort all, uh, to travel all the way to Potsdam and to discuss your take on effective transformations with us and with our audience. I now want to introduce Marie-Louise Angerer, who will present the opening lecture with the title Paradoxes of Becoming Intense on Smart Companionship, Significant Selfies and Animojis. Marie-Louise has held the chair for media theory and media studies at the University of Potsdam since October 2015 and teaches in the curriculum European Media Studies. Before that, she was a professor for media and cultural studies at the Academy of Media Arts in Cologne. She has published extensively on the topic of what she calls the effective dispositive, resulting in three books, the most recent of which came out just a few months back under the title Ecology of Affect. She also co-edited co Timing of Affect, Affect in 2014 and in the same year published Desire After Affect. I will chair this session and would like now uh, to hand over to Marie-Louise. Marie the floor now is yours. Thank you very much, Bernd. So, so, okay. <laughs> and also from my side, a warm welcome to Potsdam. And as Bernd already said, it's a real pleasure that we had the first workshop here two years ago, and that we are now finishing the first project phase two years after two years, and again in Potsdam. Uh, my title, Paradoxes of Becoming Intense on Smart Companionship, Significant Selfies and Animojis. The first session is titled Effective Trouble. And as Bernd pointed out in the description of our symposium, the effect, effective turn has recently come under pressure. The fascination with all things effective that emerged during the 1990s and peaked in the first decade of the 21st century has lost its former innocence and euphoria. For many critics, the effect, effective turn signaled a return to essentialist thinking. Affect has to do with the body, they argue, or with solipsistic withdrawal. This was confirmed, above all, by Brian Masumi's definition of affect as an, a social variable. For Ruth Lee and her followers, including in the German-speaking world, Ute Frewert, for instance, affect is non-intentional, the other of reason, the other of language, and thus immune to explanation or working through in a psychoanalytical sense. In the 1990s, affect was often celebrated as that which had been repressed by the hegemony of the symbolic in the 20th century, the century of language and psychoanalysis. From Wittgenstein's dictum, where of one cannot speak, there of one must be silent, to Freud's great modesty concerning affects, we know very little about them, through to Lacan, who described affect as something that has become displaced, like a ship's cargo. Affect has been considered as that which is not graspable, that which points beyond the subject, beyond the body, beyond the mind, and above all, beyond consciousness. In the 90s, this dimension experienced a major rehabilitation under the level of the so-called affective turn. Since then, many disciplines have been affectized or have voluntarily under the, uh, subscribed 
to an effective viewpoint. Today, it is seen as a sign of not only academic coolness to talk about the effective when one might just as well say feeling. Affect has also long since touched on politics, where at last attention has been drawn to its obscene underside, the media technological development which, I argue, have always been deeply inscribed in the enthusiasm for the effective, so going largely unnoticed. Today, it is plainly obvious that the distinction between private and public, between psychic and social, has long since been dissolved. For this reason, we have decided to focus on the two sides of the effective coin in our symposium. Firstly, as Bernd already mentioned, innovations in advanced disciplines such as effective computing or psychoinformatics and social robotics all share a focus on the recognition and modulation of human affectivity. And secondly, recent developments in politics, social media, journalism have contributed to a conspicuous rise of hate speech, speech cybermobbing, public shaming, so-called felt truths, and resentful populism. Against this background, I would like to introduce intensity as another term which has popped up within the broad field of affective discourse. Like affect, intensity has attracted much attention in recent years. So it's, not su it's no surprise that certain theorists explicitly equate affect with intensity. For Deleuze and Gattari, both affect and inten intensity point to something beyond the subject. In Brian Masumi's definition, affect marks the territory of an autonomous, it has an intensive zone. And with Tristan Garcia's La Vie en Tense, intensity returns as a Foucauldian agent of power, explicitly marking out the modern subject. In other words, even on a theoretical level, the discussion on affect, intensity, is accompanied by many ambivalences, ambiguities, and contradictions. In practical terms, the paradoxes of becoming intensive are even more striking, whereas Donna Haraway has argued in her work on companionship and significant others that our bodies are entangled with other bodies, thus opening the border for new, intense ways of experiencing life, Apple's recent introduction of animojis mark a key moment where becoming intense turns things upside down. Affect as intensity, question mark. In the light of Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe's post-structuralist theory of democracy, Oliver Machat has analyzed society as an impossible object. Within the frame of this impossible object, he has proposed a so-called affectology on the basis of ontological antagonism as the necessary next step after Laclau and Mouffe's work, work uh, on populism. The development of such an affectology, he argues, is required if we hope to understand and practice politics today. Years ago, Brian Masumi called for a politics more attuned to affect, a politics that would meet affective modulation with affective modulation. He went on to emphasize that this inevitable implied a more theoretical, theoretical and aesthetic perspective on politics, which needed to proactively adapt to a performative shift that forced it to defend in stakes by different means. Despite the differences of idiom and theoretical background, Machat's call for an affectology bears a striking resemblance to Masumi's ideas. This becomes apparent when Machat translates, translate, sorry, translates the term antagonism as intensity. Ontological antagonism, he writes, must be understood to be intensity, an interesting move in more than one regard. On the one hand, ever since Masumi's introduction of an autonomy of affect in 1996, this has been widely accepted, this has been one widely accepted definition of affect 
affect is intensity that belongs to a different order. On the other hand, when it comes to the question of affect, Laclau's theory is decidedly, decidedly informed by the Lacanian conception, which is unequivocal, unequivocal. Affect cannot be perceived or analyzed as such, and so, of course, also cannot be operationalized for political purposes. How then, my question, can we think affect as both intensity and antagonism? And think it moreover as an ontological premise allowing us to put a name on modulation, modulations beyond their scalability. As Machad writes, such modulation would range, quotation, from the revolution to the quarrel over domestic cause, from the generous strike to skiving. Antagonism cannot be quantified. It can only be experienced in its intensity, or more precisely, as intensity. Political affects, Machat goes on to argue, are not aroused by interpolation, but by an encounter with the antagonism that belongs to the register of the real. This, then, is where Laclos and Lacan's theories intersect. Yet if, as Machat underlines, the feeling of outrage and the affect of outrage are miles apart, we may well conclude that there is another plane that is prior even to the concept of antagonism. The plane of dislocation is introduced by Laclau in his new reflection on the revolution of our time in 1990. This always already precedent dislocation is where his thinking enters a conjunction with the Lacanian real and perhaps with the zone of the affective. Both the real and dislocation are unrepresentable and at once traumatic, disruptive, and productive. Therein lies a possible link to the affective, so not on the level, as Machat writes, of antagonism, which always already occupies a discursive register, but as noted on the prior level of dislocation. The difference between affect and feeling mentioned above can be located in Lacanian terms between the symbolic imaginary order and the real of affect. Media play an amplifying rather than a constitutive role in Machert's conception. They are transmitters that connect the bodies in the streets to the bodies in front of television and cell phone screens. The question that remains unresolved, however, is how this encounter with the real of affect, the genuine moment of reversal or inversion, can prompt a motion that turns one body into many bodies whose rhythm carries, them in the, carries the individual body along. For that moment is not, as Machat writes, an unfolding in the sense of the Deleuzean fold of the trembling self into the social sphere, but as I want to stress, the movement toward, toward a radical egolessness in which the bodies are left to their effective technological modulations. My second section is titled Intensity as a Figure of Thought. Intensity is a concept that appeared in the 18th century as part of the discourse of the Enlightenment. Alongside quality, quantity, and extensity, intensity was introduced into a philosophical and mathematized terminology as a force. As well as being a scalar variable, intensity always also possesses a processual developmental potential in anthropological terms. From the outset, it oscillates between nature and culture, between sensitivity and degrees of impact. It denotes what is always already synthesized, holistic, and as such, it marks something akin to the zero point. This philosophical discourse centered on Kant and his distinction between extensity and intensity was adopted by the natural sciences in the 19th century in the form of psychophysicalism. Gustav Theodor Fechner speaks of intensity 
as a stimulus that must be generated in order to go beyond the aesthetic threshold. He speaks of degrees of sensitivity and sentient nerves. But more remarkable for today's discussion or the way intensity has been discussed since the 1970s is the fusion found in the writings of Carl Philipp Moritz. In the late 18th century, he semantically crosses intensive intensity and intention, pointing to a floating, a suspended significance with reference to the relation between body and mind, intention and extension, to which the postmodern discourse of Lyotard, Deleuze and others would later return. Intensity is not a feeling. This is a quote by Jean-François Lyotard. Intensity is one of the sensual concepts that marked the counterposition to modernity and its figures of knowledge in the 20th century. Lyotard's intensities mark a rejection of the system of representation. In his essay, Notes on the Return and Capital, he writes, as soon as we speaking, we start speaking here, we find ourselves in representation. The walls of this castle are museum walls. This means, for example, the putting aside of affects and the privileging of concepts as extraterritorial, the setting aside of intensities and their weakening by means of their staging. Here Lyotard refers unquestioningly to psychoanalysis in order to salvage its ambiguous concept of desire. In Lyotard's reading of Freud, desire is an intensive force. For Freud, affect was composite, an emotion, this is the English translation for affect, an emotion in the first place includes indefinite motor innovations or discharges. Secondly, definite sensations, which moreover are of two kinds, the perception of motor activities that have already taken place and the direct sensations of pleasure and pain, which give the emotion what we call its fundamental tone. And he adds, Freud, he doesn't believe this captures the true nature of emotion. Freud also clearly underlines that this is a psychoanalytical view of the affects and one that is at odds with the James Lange view, which is, as Freud wrote, absolutely incomprehensible for us psychoanalysts and cannot be discussed. According to William James, we are sad because we feel tears. We are angry because we strike out. We are scared because we tremble. At the same time, in the last third of the 19th century, and independently of James, Karl Lange developed the same view that feelings are phenomena that accompany physical reactions. Where affect is concerned, Lacan, as the follower of Freud, follows Freud through repeatedly stressing how much psychoanalysis insisted on the conventional, artificial character of affects, on their character not as signifiers, but as signals. This, he argued, is also the source of their shifting quality. But finally, affects must also be assumed to be irreducible. Intensity also plays a central role in the work of Gilles Deleuze and Félix Gattery. Indifference and repetition from 1968 and as becoming intense in a southern plateau from 1972, Deleuze and Gattery define intensity as a variable inscribed in becoming, an element of sensory experience without which mental development is totally inconceivable. They wrote, between the intensive and thought, it is always by means of an intensity that thought comes to us. The privilege of sensibility as origin appears in the fact that in an encounter, what forces sensation and that which can only sense are one and the same thing. In effect, the intensive or difference in intensity is at once both the object of the encounter and the object to which the encounter raises sensibility. 
the particularity of an intensity they write is to be constitute, constituted by a difference which itself refers to other differences. In a thousand plateaus, series and structures are described that are present simultaneously, constantly changing, switching, connecting, exchanging, and redistributing <laughs> intensities. Here Deleuze and Gadery refer, of course, to Spinoza and his conception of bodies determined by stillness and motion, by speed and slowness. Affects appear here as becomings. They are the latitudes of a body. Latitude is made up of intensive parts falling under a capacity, and longitude of extensive parts falling under a, rela a relation. This means that the affects dwell in these transitions, watching over the interval, the fissure, the moment. They are guardians of the never closing, one might summarize Deleuze and Gattery in a slightly metaphorical way. Alfred North Whitehead is one of the key references here. What takes place in Deleuze and Gattery between latitudes and longitudes on the plateau of the senses, Whitehead attributes to the dense texture of reality that oscillates between subject and object in order to establish how order in the objective data provides intensity in the subjective satisfaction. For Whitehead, intensity is directly connected with the question of survival. To organize this survival, nature must produce societies which are structured with a high complexity, but which are at the same time unspecialized. This means that the question of intensity is a question of the ordered complexity of contrasts. In one extremely vivid passage, Whitehead describes how we humans, as enduring objects with personal order, experience our lives, our surroundings, our existence, half awake, sleeping, dreaming, remembering, concentrating on feelings, a torrent of passion. The human individual is oblivious to all else. What stands out in our consciousness then are not basic facts, but rather the derivative modification which arise in the process. The consequences of neglecting the base, this basic distinction, as Whitehead stresses, are fatal to the proper analysis of an experient occasion. The most primitive form of experience is emotional, a blind emotion, and in the higher stages of experience, this corresponds to sympathy, that is feeling the feeling in another and feeling conformally with another. With reference to primitive feeling, Whitehead speaks of vector feelings and pulses of emotion that are partly responsible for providing contrast. Here again, then, we have contrasts that are responsible for an intensity that has little in common with feelings as we are used to calling them. Whitehead is very clear on this. Feeling in human and animal experience is not merely emotion, but has always already been interpreted, integrated, and transformed into higher categories of feeling. Even so, and, I, and as I suggested in my last book, uh, Ecology of Effect, this could be helpful in thinking intensive milieus, the emotional appetitive elements in our conscious, conscious experience are those that most closely resemble the basic elements of all physical experience. The latitudes and longitudes used by Deleuze and Gattery with reference to Spinoza appear in Whitehead's work as dimensions of narrowness and dimensions of width. The dimension of narrowness is that of the intensities of individual emotions, while the dimensions of the width results from the higher stages of complexity. The ocean of feeling 
permitted by savoring the complexity of the universe is due to the dimension of this, while the emotional depths at the low levels have their limits. Consciousness is defined by Whitehead here as supplementary feeling, which does not necessarily contain a conceptual feeling in which contrasts are allowed or rejected. In spite of the brevity of this account, I hope it makes two things clear. Firstly, the subordinate role of what is introduced as consciousness, and secondly, a concept of intensity and sensation defined not in opposition to this consciousness, but as passing through it in different stages of complexity. I come to my next chapter, Smart Companionship. Writing about the work of oceanographers and deep sea divers and their specific relationship to the remote, so the so-called remote operated vehicles, shortcut ROF, used in the field, Stefan Helmreich describes the link between diver, ocean, and computer technologies as one of intimate sensing. Remote sensing is experienced as intimate, he writes, because the technologies are experienced not as separation from nature, but as pleasurable technological immersion in it, an experience felt as once immediate and hyper-mediated. The divers, the ship's crew, the technicians all operate with the rough at great depth, which turns the ocean into a media event. Helmreich sums up his experience as a member of the research crew with a reference to Sherry Turkle's second self from 1984. At that time, uh, he writes, uh, Sherry Turkle argued that people experience their computers as a second self, as a mirror. This is certainly not true, not longer the case, he continues. Instead, people experience the smart environments of which they are part as an, as he wrote, an array of selves that moves along a number line from the zero point of self-identification to the multiple identities of distributed prosthetic subjectivity. The new concept of companionship, companionship being looked for here is one that was introduced in a different way by Donna Haraway long before Sherry Turkle. In what, When Species Meet, Haraway describes the reshaping or co-shaping of human and animal bodies as a process of constant encounter and mutual affecting. In her analysis of uh, her agility training with her dog, she refers, among others, to Jean-Claude Barret, a French behaviorist, who speaks in his work on the relationship between horse and rider of unintentional movements. The relationship between human and horse is a prominent recurring theme in ethological studies. Viziane Depré recounts one such, one such case from the early 20th century in her article, The Body We Care For, Figures of Anthropozoogenesis, from 2004. Hans, the horse, was capable of answering questions cor correctly by tapping his hooves on the ground. The horse was asked to solve multiplication and di division problems and to extract square roots. Hans was also requested to spell words and, among other tests, to discriminate between colors or tones and intervals in music. Not only did Hans answer with goodwill, but he also answered most of the questions correctly. The invited experts can think of no explanation for this phenomenon, and at first, the psychologist Oskar Pfungst also had no idea how the horse did it, until it occurred to him that the horse seemed to perceive something to which humans are very oblivious. The horse, he wrote, must be reading cues. These are cues that humans cannot perceive and moreover, the cues are given to him unintentionally. 
After many experiments, Fungst finds the answer. Hans can read human bodies. Not only could he read bodies, but he could make human bodies be moved and be affected and move and affect other beings and perform things without their owner's knowledge. This means that the human body sends signals that can be neither perceived nor controlled by consciousness, but that are perceived by others. In this case, by a horse, or in Donna Haraway's case, by a dog, by a video camera, or an iPhone. And I'm going to play a very, very short video clip on the introduction of Animoji by Apple, as Bernd already mentioned, um, this fall, last fall. But the team decided to create another great experience with it as well. This is a fun one. It has to do with emojis. Now we use emojis to communicate with others and to express emotion. But of course, you can't customize emojis. They only have a limited amount of expressiveness to them. So our team created something called an emoji. These are animated emojis. These are emojis that you control with your face. In emojis track more than 50 facial muscle movements. They've been meticulously animated to create amazing expressiveness. You can just watch this, can't you? <laughs> the way you create and share an emoji are right from within Apple Messages. You said a little late. Where are you? You can pick from a dozen different animated emojis to share and express whatever you want to express to your family and friends. You see it builds a mesh in my face, and now I can just select a mask. In the 1960s, Sylvan Tompkins drew on cybernetic principles to develop an alternative to the drive-based model of the subject proposed by psychoanalysis. He based his approach on a system of affects, uh, of, of affect spectrums. In his, in, in his system, these affects constitute the primary motivation framework in humans. Manis Tompkins wrote, of all animals, the most voyeuristic. Tompkins stresses he is more dependent on his visual sense than most animals, and his visual sense contributes more information than any of his senses. The shame reaction, this was the major, major effect in Tompkins' system, con uh, consists above all in uh, averting one's eyes under the gaze of others. And as Tompkins writes, since the self lives and communicates in the face, and in this case especially in the eyes, in shame, it turns against itself, so to speak, experiencing this as a kind of mental ailment. With the central focus on the face and thus on the visibility of emotions, Tompkins laid the foundation for the media-assisted research later conducted by his student Paul Ekman into the identific identification of facial expressions and their operationalization. Based on his studies of nonverbal behavior in the four tribe of Papua New Guinea, Ekman came to the conclusion that at least the basic effects manifest themselves in a universal way via specific facial expressions. Today, we have the new iPhone with its special face ID that not only turns emojis into an emojis, but also encourages its users to share their significant selfies with everyone and anyone. As a recent newspaper article points out, profiles used to be something reserved for serial killers and psychiatric, uh, psychiatric patients, whereas today we all voluntarily profile ourselves. I come to my last section a new imperative, live intensively. 
Tristan Garcia has defined intensity in terms of electricity, equating today's ethical imperative to live an intensive life with the electrification of the modern enlightened age. Light bulbs, lighting, and mesmerism point to an irreducible moment into account. Garcia's theory can be summed up in simple terms as follows. Technology is transposed onto nature, and then nature is fed back into society. As ways of achieving an intensive life as required, building the ethical imperative, Garcia names various strategies. Among other, variation, constant variation, and secondly, speeding up, accelerationism. All of these together, he argues, leads, but don't, leads not to an intensive person, but to an exhausted person, a member of the so-called exhausted society. For years, this exhausted society or its individual unit to exhaust itself has been presented by apologists as a warning Garcia names all of the authors in question before identifying the guilty part, not clearly named by the named authors, as electronics as opposed to electricity. And electricity, a natural phenomenon that affects human, electrifying them. It is electronics, he argues, that is responsible for the end of intensity. Electronics is the de-intensifying of electricity because, as he wrote, in the electronic age, also information still passes through the, ele uh, 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 through the electrical current. Electricity no longer excites the imagination because it is merely something like a convenient means of transport for information. Intensity is now only a means, not an end. Our obsession, he wrote, are imperceptibly detaching themselves from intensity and linking up with information, because information depends not on the intensive, but on the extensive. Every price of information, be it every piece of information, be it text, sound, or image, is broken down and reassembled. In the language of Spinoza, this means that capacity is replaced by the question of relations. The resulting ethical dilemma, as described by Garcia, is an ontological antagonism that connects with the aforementioned definition by Oliver Machart, life versus thought. We are, Garcia writes, we are intensive because we live and we are consistent because we think. Living and thinking are also the two radically separate domains in Lacan, and thus also for Laclau. The thinking subject is not being, the being subject does not speak. But let's return for a moment to Whitehead for a way of possibly avoiding this dilemma. Whitehead spelled out the gradual complexity and structuring from inorganic to organic societies. As well as the importance of such gradations of inorganic and organic, which today could mean a gradation between sensorial technology and organic sensing, the distinction between physical and conceptual feeling is also of interest in the context of networked media technologies. And for this, the work of Daniel Kahneman, to which Richard Saylor and Cass Sunstein refer in their book, Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness from 2008, could be helpful. A nudge is a pressuring stimulus that is not actually noticed. One is thus triggered to do something, to see or think something differently, or to make decisions without noticing who or what is pushing one in this direction. Kahneman's book, Fa Thinking Fast and Slow, from 2011, drawing on joint research with Amos Dversky, is based around such stimuli and presents 
models for the way people make decisions. According to their initial hypothesis, people live irrational, uh, irrationally, uh, irrationally. Irrational here is not the opposite of rational, referring instead to different levels or systems of thought that find expression in different speeds of affective reaction. And it is no coincidence that Kahneman's book begins with a visual example, the face of an angry woman. And uh, immediately he writes, we know without consciously thinking about it that the woman is angry and that she is about to start screaming. This is an example of what Kahneman calls system one, a system that works quickly and automatically without effort and largely without voluntary control. One might think of the universal facial expression described in the Tomkin Ekman model and used in effective computing and also used you know, in, this, uh, in the iPhone we've just seen. This is a uh, system two, by contrast, comes into play when we are faced with a problem, a mathematical problem, for instance. It focuses on mental activity, promoting something uh, akin to conscious thought and is subjectively experienced as concentration. The power to act, the freedom to make decision. Also, people believe system two is the more important. It is actually system one that exerts a supreme control over life and the course it takes. The automatic operations of system one generate astonish, astonishingly complex patterns of ideas, but only the slower system two can construct thoughts in an orderly series of steps. The abilities covered by system one include identifying the source of a sound, grimacing at a horrific picture, detecting hostility in a voice, giving the answer to two plus two, driving a car or an, uh, in an, a car on an empty street, reading large words on a billboard in passing. As this list shows, automatic physical reactions meet here with learned automatic skills, outlining what could be described as an intensive dimension where affect operates as a force of connecting or disconnecting. I come to my preliminary conclusions. How then can we think of affect and intensity with regard to antagonism? As I said in my book, Ecology of Affect, the equation of, an, of antagonism as intensity doesn't work or might be misleading in one decisive moment. Masubi equated affect and intensity. Oliver Machat assumes the antagonistic as an irreducible moment, allowing him to erroneously assume that, that antagonism is intensity. In Laclau's work, however, antagonism is linked with the concept of dislocation, by which he means all that is excluded, that cannot be grasped. This can be equated on the one hand with the Lacanian real, and on the other with affect as an asocial pre-constitutive force. Antagonism, on the other hand, is, it what, is what comes later as an answer to the, uh, to the processual quality of dislocation. Antagonism, as Laclau, uh, Laclau wrote, is not only the experience of a limit to objectivity, but also a first discursive attempt at mastering and re-inscribing it. An exhibition that will open in November, on November 10th in Düsseldorf under the title Affect Me, Social Media Images in Art, describes its theme as follows. The way we deal with images has dramatically changed in the age of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and co. Images circulating on digital networks have become the most important means of personal expression 
for a broad public. Posts include pictures of banal moments from the users' lives as well as visual evidence straight from the trouble spots around the world. In view of their great effective potential, images ingeniously impact the entire gamut of emotions and thus trigger spontaneous responses in their recipients. These shared images move the users. They are either liked in large numbers or they provoke protests, prompt criticisms, or even unrestrained attacks. They can trigger public debate debate and appear to create a sense of community. Simultaneously, images stimulate the extensive circulation of affects." End of the quote. In contrast to this, I would argue that affects don't circulate at all. What circulates are intensities as defined as system one, or messages as defined as system two. Against this backdrop, one might attempt a tentative definition. For intensities, uh, intensities to circulate, they need the effective as a bracket or brace that opens and shuts, that clasps or turns, turns away. In addition, this suggests that affecting always also has the potential for de-affecting as pursued in different ways by, for instance, Michaela Ott in her work and Urs Steheli. To conclude, I would like to give you a very banal example of this. For some time now, postal deliveries are announced days in advance, and you can follow the status of your parcel. Recently, this advance notice has taken on an additional intensification. The deliverer sends a message informing you that he will deliver your parcel tomorrow between 2 and 3.15. In the afternoon, if possible, you arrange to be there or you try to organize a neighbor to receive the parcel for you. The next day, no parcel arrives at the stated time. Instead, you are informed that an attempt will be made to deliver the next day. The next day, you are informed that the puzzle will be delivered between 3 and 4 p.m. Maybe you try once more to make sure someone will be there. Or maybe you don't. Finally, you are informed that a neighbor has taken receipt of the puzzle for you. This form of address, more and more with each passing day, signifies the technical possibility of inducing intensity, something that previously happened without us knowing how or where now captures our specific attention. The delivery process is modulated by an effective link between deliverer and recipient, within which an intensity is artificially generated that would evaporate without this link. This may be what Garcia means when he says, intensity is no longer the goal, but the means. But this is preceded by an effective linking or disconnection. Otherwise, affect has radically lost its emancipatory potential, turning instead into a form of senseless bondage. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Marie-Louise. Um, we have about, if we want to keep in time with the coffee break, about, let's say, 10 minutes yes. for a discussion. Um, maybe there are already questions. Um, Sandra is uh, ready to hand over the microphone. Um, if not at that moment, then I would like to pick up uh, what you said about um, this imperative of live intensively because I immediately thought about what uh, Saba Zizek wrote about 20 years ago, the imperative of jouissance, uh, and uh, a book like um, Enjoy Your Symptom, which, is, uh, which seems to have a very different take on, on let's say, the, how we lead our life. Um, because Enjoy Your Symptom has some subsur sub, uh, subversive element in it, I would say. Uh, whereas Live Intensively doesn't have the same uh, connotation, at least for me. Um, and then I was thinking about um, what about uh, the probable uh, imperative of live effectively? 
because I wouldn't know what that should mean, actually. Uh, which uh, somehow points back for me to your point that uh, FX still has some, I would say, some sub subversive force. Or does it? That's the question, actually. I was um, this time quite radically uh, in, in uh, how to say, uh, to um, theorize affect as an, a, a radically empty figure. So you can't live actually effectively. You can't uh, live e effectively. I would say affect for me has more and more over the last years uh, turned into an empty, an empty figure, but not an empty figure in that, uh, th that, is, that is introduced to help to think something with, but an empty figure which is responsible for connecting or disconnecting. And in the moment some, um, a body is connected with its environment, then intensity might, might uh, come into play in the terms of contrast, complexity, reducing complexity, or uh, 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 introducing contrast so that one can see something or one, one uh, is focusing on something. So what, uh, the, the more I was working on this intensity, uh, the term of intensity, the, 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 the more, the, the clearer I got, you know, that, the, that this, my, my understanding that affect in intensity are not congruent, are not the same, are not, one can't say affect is intensity. I mean, this is now, you know, against Brian Masumi's very, very important introduction uh, 20 years ago. But I think, you know, it doesn't work. One can't work, you know, in, in terms of uh, political discourse. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help you at all because affect is always mixed with feelings. It's always when somebody is shouting uh, angry uh, or with an angry voice, you know, it's, it's, this is effective. But it's not. There's something, there's something going on or already in, on its way before this shouting, before this shout. And the, 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 this, this pre-moment or this pre-constitutive moment is this bracket or brace, as I would like to call affect. I mean, this is a kind of, you know, uh, an experiment to try to think affect as an empty figure and then to fill it in case, you know, it's connecting, to fill it with degrees of intensities. Thank you. Um, I think I saw two arms going up. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Michaela was a bit first and then I saw Paul. Oh, Paul was the first, great, thank you. Thank you for a, a, a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it, and particularly the, the point at the end about the linking or connection when we're having our parcels delivered and how it's that connection <laughs> that creates the intensity. And I it's getting concrete. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like that very much. But, um, and I also like the way that, uh, if I understand you correctly, you're challenging Laclau Garcia's fundamental contrast between life and thought as if those two things are, if you like, utterly at odds, the one supplying boring consistency yes. and the other supplying very exciting intensity. Um, and it just made me think of, you know, there's a, there's a uh, wonderful book that Whitehead wrote called um, The Function of Reason, where he defines, a, he, first of all, he makes a, a comparable distinction to the one that, that Kahneman and Tversky draws between uh, a form of reason that he identifies with Ulysses, the fox, a sort yep. of cunning, a sort of um, um, system one form of, of, of operating. And he contrasts that with what he calls the reasoning of Plato, this sort of metaphysical big picture reasoning. And the whole f po point of that, that book is to say that the crucial thing is to link together those two um, modes, if you like, and he ends up by defining the, the, the function of reason as the support or the, or the promotion of the art of life. And I think that's a wonderful statement of the need to connect those two things that are otherwise spun apart. But, but it, it also I, it occurred to me, and I wanted to put this to you as a question, when, when I, I was intrigued by the point that you made about how Freud said you know, that he could not condone even thinking about the James Langer. <laughs> but this is a, a correct quote. <laughs> yeah. And it made me think how interesting that is, given that both of those 
psychologists were very influenced by Spinoza and especially how really what James Lang is doing when, when, when William James is making that routine around saying we don't run from the bear because we're scared, rather we're, we're scared because we run from the bear. That's the sort of, if you like, the, the usual statement of the James Langer theory. And it seems to me that so obviously that proposition is a riff on Spinoza's proposition in the third part of the ethics where he says we don't desire something because we say it's good, mm -hmm. we say something's good because, because we desire, desire it. it. Yeah. Now, it seems so evident to me that what, what James is doing is developing that Spinozist proposition in, in a very sort of, I think, positive and provocative way. And that, that Freud would completely misunderstand that is strange because Freud was also thinking in, in, at his best moments in a Spinozist way. So I just wondered how... You, you know, whether you have any reflections on that sort of connection between James Langer and Freud, rather than polarizing them in the way in which we're doing thought and uh, life in, yeah. in, in, in Leclau and, and, yeah. and Garcia, can we not integrate them via that shared influence? I have for quite a long time tried to bring these two positions or to rethink the two positions, the one of Freud and Lacan, and on the other hand, Deleuze and Spinoza. You know, these two, two polarized positions. And in uh, my book, Desire After Affect, um, I, my conclusion was that psychoanalysis, um, in, in that both sides are expressing something quite similar in very, very different ways of thinking it. When Freud says uh, affect is a signal, it's not a, it's not a uh, uh, it doesn't mean anything. That means affect can just, you know, want, is wandering, is wandering without a sig uh, 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 signifier. I guess, you know, that, that, this, that, uh, that the way James and Lange bring these things together, you know, the, the angriness or the, the crying and the tears. This is something Freud would, uh, uh, would deny. He would say, you know, it's not, we, are, we are not crying because we are, uh, but there is something going on which might be some, something else, which doesn't mean tears are, means sadness. But there is something, you know, with this uh, changing nature of affects that Freud comes in a way close to the body, uh, the, this bodily um, moments uh, James Langyard is describing. And, um, but it's, it was funny, you know, when I, when I read this thing again on affect in Freud, and he is so clear about it, I thought for the first moment when I was rereading it, he was also upset about maybe the success of James Lange. Maybe he was totally, uh, he was annoyed, you know, by the success of uh, these other guys and not uh, psychoanalysis. So maybe it was a very <laughs> small, small uh, movement. But I don't know, you know. So, but I mean, it was not Freud, you know, who was uh, who introduced, you know, this radical split between thinking and being. And this is, you know, due to Lacan. And then Laclau, of course, you know, with his uh, with his. Refer reference to Derrida and then uh, Lacan, he he couldn't, you know, give up, you know, this split, this 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 split subject or the, the understanding of a split subject. And I think, you know, that uh, with the, with affect or with in with uh, as the, that the, this turn into affect or this material turn or performative turn uh, over the last decades has made it very clear that you know that this split is on the way a constitutive moment of thinking. But actually, in terms of politics, it doesn't help. So, you know, I, I think, you know, that well, with Kahneman, and in, I, I was very interested, you know, in that the, the day from a very different background, against a very different background, you know, they, they, uh, they, they offer uh, an understandable uh, uh, notion of not a, not a split system, but a system which goes through. I have two more questions. Uh, the one was Michaela, and uh, after that, Pierre. 
Yeah, Marie Louise, thanks a lot for the rich uh, talk of shifting concepts. Um, I have many questions, and I will maybe ask two. One is uh, the question of defining affect as a pre-constitutive force. Why don't you make a difference between affection and affect? Because I think this would make it much clearer that affection is the process of something coming together or separating itself, what you call connecting and disconnecting. And affect is the expression of a certain affective process, which Deleuze also says at different uh, moments that affect is always linked to expression. It is not the process of constitution or pre-constitution or whatsoever. But the main point or my main question concerns antagonism. I still think we should not identify antagonism with intensity because antagonism is a descriptive term of a certain sociopolitical theory and it tries to express a certain economic and ideological difference and a, a split, as you said yourself. And I think intensity has something to do with continuity and it's a total different register. And if we uh, eliminate this difference, we also eliminate the possibility of antagonisms, which we have to still uh, um, consider since they are important elements of the society. And I think intensity is more a, a, a quality of experience, which can be in different uh, domains, of course, in the life between, let's say, life and thought, but it does not refer to the same domain of a society. Therefore, I would very much like to have them differentiated and not put together, even if Oliver Marcats has this tendency to, to co combine them uh, nowadays. But then, you know, this is what I wanted to, to explain today, that it's not that I, I think, you know, it's misleading to uh, equate affect and uh, to, uh, antagonism and intensity, or to say uh, uh, and, uh, antagonism. I mean, the thing is, you know, that he is not, uh, Oliver Marat is not referring to Brian Masumi. That's, it was introduced by myself, that I said you know, that affect, that one of the, uh, one of the most widely accepted uh, definition of affect since Brian Musumi's uh, text has been that affect is intensive or affect is intensity. Now, if you know, if he then talks about an affectology and where he is referring to uh, affect, of course, and then he speaks of antagonism and then he is equating it with intensity, that is what I said, you know, is misleading. And I was trying, you know, to get, to bring it apart again, you know, and to say, but then to ask, you know, of course, you know, uh, antagonism is from a very different uh, discursive field. It's a very different uh, concept of thinking. But it's also, you know, the thing is with this, the uh, antagonism is, you know, this, this split thing. You know, this is the, the, the first moment of splitting something, getting, bringing a split into something, bring, introducing a gap. And then the gap might be, you know, uh, intense, since, you know, it, it introduces complexity. So this is a way, you know, one could think, you know, intensity and uh, antagonism in, in one way or the other together. But then affect, and of course, in, I, 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 I used, you know, very often affect instead of affect activity or affective as a process. But in my last statement, I said, you know, the affective is. So, you know, I, I'm not, I'm of course, you know, with this empty figure, I'm not uh, talking about the effect at all, you know, as a, but it's a, a figure in the, in the a, a figure as a, as a process, a figure of a moment of movement. That's the way, you know, I would like to work or, or to understand it. Is this a kind of response. We're also running a bit out of time, yeah. uh, but uh, there's one more question by Pierre. Thank you. I, uh, thank you. I really enjoyed your talk and your uh, shift from affects to intensity. So I was wondering about the uh, senses involved in the circulation of intensity. Uh, remember that in the end of uh, Mille Plateau, of Thousand, of Thousand Plateau, 
Deleuze and Guattari relates the intensity with the aptics by opposition to the optics. And for instance, when you discuss the communication with the horse hands and the communication with the um, uh, iPhone, the communication with the horse seems to involve many different senses, whereas the communication with the iPhone involves only what seems to be optics. The phone sees your face and from your face it uh, it intends to read your, or it tries to read your, your emotion. And that's, that, that would really be optics, in, it seems, in the sense. That's a global view of the face and from that. So I was wondering whether uh, this difference between optics, and, which is essentially touch, and even if it's not only touch, and between optics and optics would enter into the idea of a circulation of intensities, whether, I mean, um, whether uh, intensities could, uh, whether the circulation of intensities would involve uh, this plurality of sense or uh, something that is beyond the difference that we make between the different senses, like in Whitehead, you mentioned Whitehead and the circulation of feelings. In the same way, the feeling will circulate in, white, in Whitehead's cosmology um, uh, through something that is not yet differentiated between uh, senses like touch or sight. So I was wondering about this uh, uh, variety of senses involved in intensities and whether they could be uh, intensive technology if they, they rely on optics. Yeah, that's a very good point because, you know, the Animoji uh, video clip is, of course, you know, in no way uh, is not referring exactly to, to the story about Hans the horse. Because Hans the horse did see uh, something very different. He, he, he sees uh, human beings running, sitting, moving around. The Animoji here with the ice phone is only taking up your face. So it's, it's, it's as you said, you know, it's a very... Uh, Victoriaized uh, 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 aspect, you know. But I think, you know, the face is one aspect, but the body, of course, you know, is by uh, media technology, uh, the, is that all the senses of the bodies are controlled, are calculated, are uh, uh, um, archived, are taken into uh, account. If you think of surveillance technology or whatsoever, or computer games, you know, so the Animochi was one. Because, you know, I wanted, you know, to, to, to get to this uh, out moment, you know, where these expressions or, you know, our mimicry is sort of translated automatically without actually that, of course, you know, we know that what, that what we are doing, but actually it, it happens even without our knowledge, you know, or without our intention. So this was the moment I wanted to make sure with this video clip and, and, and combine it with, with Hans the Horse. But of course, you know, this, it takes only one aspect, you know, of senses into account, you know, and not many others, for instance, the haptic, as you said. Okay, then thank you, Marie-Louise, again for your talk and thank you for your questions.